Hello! Before I start off this retrospective of Sunless Skies, let me first give you a bit of background into my history with this game's predecessor, Sunless Sea. Sunless Sea might be my literal number one favourite ever game. That's right, above Dark Souls or Final Fantasy X or Resident Evil 4. That's certainly not to suggest that those games are inferior to Sunless Sea, but regardless of any objective measures of game quality, I would take Sunless Sea over any of them. In fact, I love Sunless Sea. That game's atmosphere, writing, exploration, music and style absolutely captivated me, and I've put a good 200 hours into it over the last few years. But of course, after playing it, I sure as hell wanted more. Sunless Sea is set in the Fallen London universe. Fallen London being a browser game dating back nearly 15 years and still going strong today. Although I briefly dipped my toe into Fallen London, I could quickly tell that it wasn't quite what I was looking for, though I may give it another go one day. But, of course, there was another prominent game set in the Fallen London universe, and that game was Sunless Skies, released in January of 2019. The only problem for me was that I couldn't actually play the damn thing. See, I didn't get a game in PC until October of 2022, and thus had played Sunless Sea exclusively on my PS4 up until that point. And so, as much as I wanted to play this one, I could not, at least not until a console release was put into place. Thankfully, a console release did come, and I only had to wait two and a half years. Yes, that sucked. I remember checking the developer's website and social media every week for any news of a release during that period, but on May 2021, both console gamers and PC gamers alike were graced with Sunless Skies Sovereign Edition, a release and massive update containing a ton of content additions and gaming improvements. I was hyped as hell for this game, because I'd been dying for more of that unique dark magic that I'd gotten from Sunless Sea. And though I will say that my initial foray into Sunless Skies was a tad rocky in places, I'm pleased to report that after what must be a good 100 hours with this game, like its predecessor, I absolutely love it. And there's magic here for sure, though admittedly a different kind of magic compared to the first game. Although Sunless Sea was by no means a perfect game, it's still made for an imposing shadow, especially from a writing standpoint. But Sunless Skies managed to match the quality of the first in some places and vastly exceed it in others. And coming from a Sunless Sea fanatic like me, that's really saying something. But enough chitter chatter, I think it's time we talked about what the hell this game's all about, what it does well, what it doesn't do so well, and how it all compares to the first game. Let's talk Sunless Skies. So, before I provide a background into the setting of Sunless Skies, let me first stress that the Fallen London universe is very weird. Although it shares many traits and similarities with our own world, there are also countless divergences, eccentricities and sentient sigils of blue fire, and some other stuff too. Usually in my videos I provide an intro to the game's story and talk about gameplay, graphics, etc then come back and finish talking about the plot later on, but for Sunless Skies, I'm not quite going to do that, because there is no mandatory plot in this game. Rather, the game has hundreds of stories found at dozens of locations across multiple regions, and almost all are optional. There is a really fantastic storyline or ambition to follow in the game, but you never have to do it if you don't want to, and the game itself even discourages you from tackling it on a first playthrough, although I definitely recommend you try it on a second playthrough at least, because it's well worth experiencing. So, back in the time of Victorian Britain, London was stolen away by bats and then deposited deep underground into a massive body of water within the earth called the Untersee. In the fallen London universe, the natural laws, even the laws of life and death, are only maintained due to the light from the stars. In this universe, light is law. Also, the stars are actually sentient beings here, referred to as the Judgments, who have their own language, wars and interstellar dramas. What happens in the absence of the light from the Judgments? 
Well, you get the kind of world we saw in Sunless Sea, where nearly anything could happen and nothing was as it seemed. Sunless Sea had a bunch of different endings to go for, but there was one questline in particular which holds the most significance to Sunless Skies, and it's the one concerning the merchant venturer and his desire to open and travel through the towering and terrifying gates of the Avid Horizon, because through these gates lies a sea yet more sunless. And that brings us to Sunless Skies, because although the above ending was optional, canonically the Avid Horizon does get opened, and this marks the start of the next epoch of Fallen London, now risen through the gates and into the heavens. Now, as you might have guessed by the titles of these games, whereas Sunless Sea has you captain various seafaring vessels, Sunless Skies has you travelling across the very, you guessed it, skies. Gone are the days of conventional ships, because now flying locomotives are very much in vogue. Although not a massive amount of time has passed between this game and the first, significant developments have gone on in this new territory. London is very much the dominant power, though there is certainly some lively opposition, as well as remnants of old powers from the days of the Untersea. Although many things have changed, there are some elements that are as present here as they ever were down under, like danger, terror and madness. Although the diverse and far-flung populations of the Untersea were almost entirely shielded from the stars, this new higher world has people in far closer proximity to celestial consciousness, although the native stars of some regions are all but absent, or, as we see in Albion, London's new main territory, darkly destroyed, a chilling testament of London's power perhaps. Furthermore, just as beasts, pirates and otherworldly beings prowled the dark waters and corners of the Untersea, even stranger and larger entities still roam the skies here, beyond the avid horizon, in this sea yet more sunless. So that's a bit of an explanation, I guess, as to the world of sunless skies. I'll talk more about various lore elements as appropriate throughout the video, but suffice to say for now, the world and lore are fascinating, wonderful, and above all, strange. I will also say that it feels different compared to Sunless Sea. Yes, there's a bunch of similarities of course, but the general feel of this world has a different flavour and tone to the first game. I guess if I was to put it one way, whereas Sunless Sea was very dark, both in tone and environment, Sunless Skies is far brighter, although there are certainly degrees of darkness found here too. Furthermore, Sunless Skies is actually really, really funny. The first game certainly had a very old-fashioned, dry, British brand of wit and humour in places, no doubt, but the humour in this game is far more pervasive and concentrated, and way more British. I think the humour here is one of the things that gives the game such a distinct feel compared to the first game. And though I do adore Sunless Sea, I certainly appreciated the light-heartedness found throughout the various verdant, grimy, shadowy and deathly regions of Sunless Skies. But that's enough about the writing for now, because I'll talk more about that later. Although the player now explores the skies rather than the sea, the core gameplay remains much the same. It's all still done from a top-down perspective, and your locomotive remains able to move around in what is essentially a large 2D plane. The same way Sunless Sea had main ports dotted around the Untersea, the sequel also has such ports, located at important settlements throughout each of the game's four regions. And that brings us to the first significant change from the first game. Whereas Sunless Sea gave the player one huge body of water to explore, mostly consisting of open sea with ports and other landmarks and points of interest distributed throughout, Sunless Skies instead has four disconnected regions. Furthermore, these regions are nowhere near as open as the first game. I mean, they're certainly all open for exploration nearly immediately, but gone are the days of being able to simply pick a direction and move straight to a chosen location. Now, navigation of the environment is necessary, and the environment itself plays a key role in your chances for survival when out on a long voyage with limited fuel and supplies. Now, mountains, ancient architecture and massive machinery serve as both passage and impediment to any would-be sky captain. Some locations can be accessed by two or three different routes, whereas other places are far more remote and only accessible via one specific route, and looking at you, Hybris. 
This change honestly has a major effect on the way the game feels. It can make it more tense, because when you're first out exploring a region, you don't know the structure of the world or what its passages actually lead to. Do you press onwards with the hope that there's a port ahead to restock your locomotive? Or do you double back the way you can, like a coward? The route of your voyage was certainly a thing to be considered in the first game, but only to the extent where you'd plan out which order you'd visit each port before returning back to London, whereas here, your routing matters way more, because very rarely will you ever be able to make a beeline to your chosen destination. To be clear, I don't think this change to the way the player navigates the game world is necessarily better in this game compared to the first, but it's certainly different. Now, although there ends up being a significant amount of time in each region that's effectively inaccessible thanks to these natural and man-made caverns, let's not get it twisted. This game is massive. I love the Untersee from the first game, and I love that it's one big open map, but I really appreciate the sheer size of each of this game's regions, and the fact that there are bloody four of them. They didn't need to add in four massive, completely different open regions to explore, but they did, and that's sick. The first region the player finds himself in is the Reach. It's by far the most verdant, vibrant, and bright of the four regions, which is interesting considering it has no sun. The Reach is host to a diverse range of biomes, sporting snow, vegetation, fungi, and more. And there's also an ongoing war between two civil factions, the Stovepipes, representing the interests of London, and the Tacates, who want nothing to do with London. The main port, and I suppose capital, of the Reach is New Winchester. In Sunless Sea, the main port throughout the whole game was of course London, but here there's a main port found in each region, usually located near the centre of the map. These main ports are very important and will certainly be your most frequented locations, because they provide relief from terror, provide information on various profitable prospects available at other minor ports in the region, and are where many of the game's quest lines are found and or progressed. As for the other regions, the next one the player is most likely to visit is Albion, where London is based, and Her Royal Majesty. Albion looks and feels completely different to the Reach, in that all elements of nature and wilderness have been either tamed or removed entirely. In Albion, massive hulking machines and structures of iron rust and grind in the background, filling the air with cloying smog and fog. London itself, located at the centre of this region, is a bustling but filthy metropolis of bizarre pipes, plates and pollution. Although there is a variety of biomes found throughout Albion, they're mostly semi or even entirely man-made, and this is especially true of the Clockwork Sun, which constantly keeps Albion illuminated with its maddening, twisted light. Then we have Eleutheria. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Come on, I'm Scottish. Eleutheria is by far the darkest of all the regions, having no sun to speak of, and is home to all manner of beasts which abhor any trace of light. The main port here is Pan, a strange location with very different customs to our own. And dotted all around Pan are smaller factions like the Brazen Brigade and Winters Reside, all of which play a part in the politics of Pan. Unintended alliteration there, pardon me. Many sections of Eleutheria defy all explanation, such as the infinitely large Langley Hall, or the wild darting gaze of the Halved. Also found in this region, beyond a pure black region called the Belt of Midnight, is Eagles and Pyrian, a rival to London, also having ascended through the Avid Horizon decades ago. And lastly, there's the Blue Kingdom, the Kingdom of the Dead. Although this region is about half the size of each of the others, it more than makes up for it in sheer character and beauty. The Blue Kingdom is where every soul goes after death. The rules of life and death work very differently here, and indeed, the whole process of death has become downright bureaucratic. The main port of the Blue Kingdom is Sky Barnet, and the other ports in this region revolve around death, souls, and even what lies beyond death. The Blue Kingdom is filled with terrifying wonders and beautiful horrors, and it is not a place which is considered particularly welcoming to the not yet dead. I think I should now get into the actual gameplay mechanics of Sunless Skies. 
Your time with this game consists of four different elements. Exploration, trade, combat and reading. All four of these elements are fundamental to how this game works and feels. Firstly, exploration is instantly encouraged. After reaching New Winchester within the first 10 minutes into the game, you're essentially free to do and roam as you please. You'll find yourself in the centre of a massive circular map, almost entirely greyed out with fog, only becoming clear as you venture into new territory and ports. The game is just begging you to explore, but of course this comes with a great deal of initial trepidation, because these sunless skies are perilous, and many an ill-prepared sky captain have met their fate in these heights, left suspended, floating and very, very dead. Morbid cautionary testaments to other passing captains. See, travel requires crew, supplies, fuel and of course ample sovereigns with which to procure these necessities. Crew is needed for your ship to function adequately and for certain skill checks and interactions. Although the number of crew you have of course refers to how many folk you have aboard your vessel, it helps more to think of them just as a resource, as heartless as it may seem. And by that token, crew is something you don't want to run out of. When your number of crew drops below half of your locomotive's capacity, bad things will start to happen and your terror will increase faster, and if it reaches zero, well good luck. You're going to want a decent number of crew relative to your capacity, though it's a bit of a balancing act, because the more crew you have, the higher your rate of supply consumption. Your supplies are always going down, except when engaged in reading at a port, where in-game time is paused. They can be bought at most, but not all, ports, and, as you'd imagine, are necessary for the survival of your captain and crew. Run out of supplies, and your crew will start dying off, and when the last of your crew dies, you die. Then, we have fuel, which is what keeps your locomotive in motion. It goes down gradually whenever you move, but thrusting left or right will eat up a small chunk of it instantly. Your fuel will also get consumed quicker if your ship's lights are left on, but leaving your lights off will cause your terror to increase faster. Like supplies, fuels can be bought at nearly any port, and unlike in Sunless Sea, fuels and supplies are the same price anywhere you go. As you might imagine, it's very important to manage these resources effectively, and preparation is everything. It's usually best to err on the side of caution and buy plenty of fuel and supplies before any voyage into unknown territory, because you don't know exactly where you'll end up, how long it'll take, or what you might encounter along the way. As much time as I've spent with the game at this point, I still find myself in dire straits at times, and things can get very desperate when you start running low on fuel or supplies, especially when you're in the middle of nowhere. Like in this situation here, where I was running super low on everything and found myself at a dead end, knowing I'd have to double back to lead beater and stain rod nature reserve. It seemed hopeless and I came far too close for comfort to running flat out of fuel, but I made it to port just in time. Often you will find yourself coming across resources in the nick of time, but sometimes you won't, and that's why it's important to not skimp on the essentials. This is certainly true when traversing the reach, but preparation and discretion become ever more important when in the other darker and more perilous regions. As well as all the aforementioned resources, there is of course another important meter to always be aware of, and that's terror. Another mechanic brought over from the first game. You see, nearly anything you do in this game will cause your terror to rise. It will stop rising when engaged in a text screen or when close to a port, but at all other times it's going up, regardless of how calm your current situation may seem. One way to slow the rate of increase is to keep your lights on, but then this will use up more fuel, so you've got to decide for yourself when to leave your lights on and when to switch them off. Problem is, if you're running low on fuel, then you really can't afford luxuries like, you know, light. And it can be quite alarming how quickly your terror meter can go from looking peachy to, oh my god, we're all gonna die. While terror does have its standard rate of increase, there are other elements which can cause it to go up and thankfully down. A really cool addition to Sunless Skies is horrors. Each region has its own various horrors strewn throughout the map, and while the nature and form of these horrors vary wildly, their effect is the same. They'll make you and your crew very, very afraid. One example from the Reach is Faith's Fall, 
a carcass of a massive interstellar messenger. Then we have the dead son of Albion, replaced by a greater horror still, Clockwork Son. Stick around these monstrous monuments and you'll find your terror meter quickly getting out of hand. But bear in mind that some quests are tied to visiting these landmarks, and sometimes you've got to pass by them to get to a particular destination. Thankfully, there's a counterpart to these heavenly horrors, and those are wonders. Visiting a wonder will cause your terror to go down by a modest amount, and there are often worthwhile or profitable interactions to be had at these locations. Some of these are just stunning to look at too, like the Xanthus Moon, found near Eagles and Pyrian in Eleutheria, or the Horologian in the north of the Blue Kingdom. Of course, you can't just spam terror heals at these places, because there's a cooldown before you'll be able to benefit from them again. You also get a big reduction in terror any time you return back to a region's main port after being out at sky for long enough, and any time you discover a new port, though this means that terror becomes a bit harder to manage when all the ports have already been discovered. There are a ton of other ways terror can be increased or decreased throughout the game. Very often when you take a risk for potential profit as part of one of the game's countless text-based skill checks, the punishment for failure is more terror. But fear not, pun intended, because as long as you know where to look, terror can almost always be kept in check. If things get out of hand though, and your terror increases past 50, you'll often be given the choice to convert a big chunk of terror into a nightmare. If you do let your terror get to 100, or accumulate 4 nightmares, however, you're done. <laughs> as with the first game, the trick is knowing the mechanics knowing roughly what to expect out in those unexplored skies, and being prepared. Thus, at first it's quite likely you'll run into some very sticky situations. But this is exactly what the devs want, because dying is all part of the game. That's right, permadeath. But there's other stuff to discuss before we get into all that business. Let's talk trade. The exchange of goods. So exploration is great and all finding new outlandish locations, and seeing all manner of wonders, horrors and other assorted curiosities. But come on, we need more of an incentive than that. And that's where trade comes in, the main driver of all your exploits, and the thing that encourages ever bolder exploration into the unknown expanses of the sky. The currency in sunless skies is sovereigns, and you're going to want a lot of them, because a lot of sovereigns are essential to procure fuel, supplies, crew new equipment for your locomotive, and shiny brand new locomotives. Although sovereigns are a reward for some quests and for triumphing over combat with pirates and beasts, the main way you'll be making more of that sweet, sweet moolah <laughs> is through trade. Buying one type of good at one port to sell it at a higher price at another port, except it's done a bit different here compared to the first game. In Sunless Sea, different ports bought and sold different goods for different prices. So maybe you'd stock up on sapphires at Port Carnelian and then sell them off for a profit to some northern port. While in sunless skies, trade is primarily done via prospects. When at a main port, you can take a look at the bazaar to see if there's any promising prospects that have come in. Maybe Palmyre and Plenty Circus is desperately on the lookout for more barrels of unseasoned hours and they're willing to pay way above the going rate. So now you can go to a port that sells hours at the standard rate, stock up and then head to the circus and offload them for huge profit, as well as a nice little bonus if you manage to fully meet their needs. This is how prospects work and you can make huge money doing this. It won't always be necessary to fly off to a totally different port to stock up on one particular type of good either, because sometimes you'll get lucky and get an opportunity to stock up on discounted items at the bazaar leading to even greater profit. One issue I've seen a bunch of times with this system however, is that sometimes you'll visit a port that is apparently desperate for however many of a particular item, and then you'll scroll down only to find that you can buy that exact item at that same port. Don't get me wrong, it's handy as hell when this happens, but it also makes zero sense and can be quite immersion breaking. Although this doesn't happen all the time, it's really not as rare as you might think. But, that aside, I really like the prospect system. I wasn't a big fan at first, due to my fierce love of Sunless Sea, but after a bit of time, I really did come round to it, and the feeling of delivering on a big request for some expensive items 
is really rewarding when you see that you've made a nice fat grand or two. Now, although prospects will likely be your main money-making method, there's another important way, and it's a mechanic that I'm very glad they brought over from Sunless Sea. Of course, I'm talking about port reports. The forces of London and other factions like to be kept well abreast of all manner of goings-on all around each region, thus, at every port you visit, you'll be able to produce a port report. These are used to give the player some interesting insight into each location, but more importantly, they can be exchanged for sovereigns back at the region's main port. In Sunless Sea, the value of port reports depended on how distant and dangerous that port was. So, a report on the Cumian Canal would only get you, say, five echoes, but a report on Easterville would get you way more, because greater risk should mean greater reward. Well, in Sunless Skies, every report will get you a square 100 sovereigns. Doesn't matter where the report came from, you get 100 sovereigns for it. Also, now when you hand in your reports, it's all just done in a one -er. Whereas you'd get fun and interesting dialogue for each report you handed into London, depending on where it came from in the first game. The port report system is still great, but I do think it lost a little bit of its flavour since the first game. I don't know, I guess I just missed the feeling of coming back to London after a long voyage with goods and reports galore to offload to the Admiralty. Whereas in Sunless Skies, usually you'll hand in your reports to a small port close to the main port, rather than the main port itself. I said port way too many times there. You won't get rich in the game with port reports, Jesus. Uh, but just as with the first game, it can sustain your finances even after a not so profitable voyage, which will sadly happen from time to time. And of course, as your purse begins to fatten, you're probably going to want to spend those sovereigns on some cool new stuff, and this game's got you covered. There's a wide range of weapons, tools, shielding, engines, cabins and more to be purchased at the main ports in each region, with later regions having more expensive and powerful equipment available. As long as you've got the stats and sovereigns for something, as well as room on your locomotive to house it, then you are golden. While upgrades like this are very important, at some point you're going to want to just go the whole hog and replace your entire vessel. Just as with the first game, it's not really a case of each more expensive locomotive being better than the last, as there's other things to take into consideration, like weight, gun slots, auxiliary slots, crew capacity, hull, and more. You've got to weigh up the pros and cons and get one that works for you. And if it looks really cool too, all the better. Regardless of which locomotive you buy though, they all operate the same in the air, so we're not talking totally different styles of gameplay here. It's just stat differences at the end of the day. Did someone say stats? Yep, there's stats here and levelling up and everything. Because among many things, Sunless Skies is also an RPG. And indeed, near the start of the game, you'll be asked to select two stats to specialise in. Although Sunless Sea had five stats, hearts, mirrors, iron, veils and pages, Sunless Skies cuts it down to four, scrapping pages entirely. I kind of get this decision because the primary function of the pages stat in the first game was just to reduce the amount of experience or fragments required to level up, which I guess can be thought of as somewhat unnecessary. Even so, I kind of miss pages. Although the stats you specialise in won't radically change one playthrough compared to the next, it's certainly still fun and worthwhile to try new things each time. For example, most equipment actually has stat requirements tied to them, meaning that a cool weapon with a Veils requirement of 65 might simply be unavailable to you on a given playthrough if you've decided to focus on, say, Hearts and Iron. The primary effect that stats have on your playthrough, however, are on the game's many skill checks. Skill checks happen all the damn time, and always depend on one of your four stats, Although you don't just get to pass a skill check automatically because a stat happens to be high enough, because your chances of success are percentage based, meaning that if you get lucky you can still pass a skill check for a stat you haven't invested in. Being an RPG you can of course level up too, and this is done by accumulating enough experience, obviously. Experience is gained by discovering new landmarks, ports, triumphing in combat, and by completing quests and prospects. Once you hear that oh so satisfying sound, you can pick a couple of stats to increase, 
done via a pretty creative character development system with the stats you're choosing to increase come with a bit of story behind them. I mean, it doesn't really lead to your Sky Captain becoming any sort of fleshed out character or anything, but still, I like it. Although you might be tempted to be a sort of jack of all trades, I'd advise against it and just try and focus on a couple of stats to specialise in. Whichever two you choose, there will be viable equipment configuration options available to you and you'll never really be screwed out of quest lines, though you might have a hard time becoming a smuggler if your veils ain't too high. And now I think it's high time that I talked combat, because this is one area where Sunless Skies massively improved upon the first game. In Sunless Sea, combat was effectively turn based. Although you could move around and it did have an effect on the outcome of combat, nearly all sea battles essentially boiled down to slowly reversing while waiting on your weapon to charge up, firing then repeating until the enemy was dead. There wasn't really any skill or dexterity involved and combat largely felt the same regardless of whether you were fighting a terrifying fluke or a nimble pirate ship. In Sunless Skies, however, things are very different. For a start, you're faster, even in your starting locomotive, whereas in the first game, your first ship moved torturously slow. You can also thrust left or right, which is absolutely crucial for combat, because now it's possible to actually dodge projectiles and other stuff. Furthermore, there's no waiting for your weapon to charge up, then waiting for it to charge up again, because now combat is way more in the action camp, having left behind the pseudo turn based mechanics of the first game. Your weapons don't lock on or anything either, so I hope you have good aim, because you're going to be firing at a lot of targets that are just as nimble as you, if not more so, though you can enable some aim assist if you really need it, but I'd advise against it, because come on, <laughs> you don't need it. There's tons of different types of enemies to fight now, and a lot of them feel very distinct from each other. The different types of attacks and movement requiring different approaches if you want to come out on top, which you will, obviously. Some enemies, like the colonised Cantankeri, will barely move at all whilst radiating a constant stream of slow moving projectiles, whereas guests move all over the damn place and can be super hard to hit. In fact, I'm betting that these enemies are how a lot of players end up dying on a first playthrough, because they can really mess you up, especially if you're still flying around with starting equipment. While the more turn based feel is gone, don't think you can just go firing rocket after rocket into the air with reckless abandon, because you do have a heat meter to worry about. Once this meter gets close to filling up, it'll start to beep, warning you to hold off firing any more weapons until it goes down a bit. If you get too excited and allow the meter to get too high, then you're going to have a good 5 seconds where you'll be unable to fire any weapons or perform evasive manoeuvres unless you want to have a chunk of your locomotive's health taken off. As you can imagine, this is the last thing you want to happen in a fight, because the enemy sure ain't going to politely wait for you to cool down a bit before going in for the kill. See, I put it to you, sir, that Sunless Sea was not a hard game. The only reason it feels tough at first it's because you don't know what you're doing, but once you gain a bit of understanding about that game's mechanics and how to prepare for voyages, Sunless Sea became way less about challenge and far more about simply going through the motions and getting things done. Even the challenge from combat encounters in that game drops off a cliff once you get a mid-tier ship with an extra gun slot. Well, dear viewers, all seven of you, or however much, things are very different in Sunless Skies because combat in this game is damn hard, and if you get complacent with the wrong kind of enemy, you will die. It's easy for your locomotive to overheat, some enemies hit really hard, and if you venture too far out without being adequately prepared, you can get badly punished. I remember my very first death in this game, and I was damn furious about it. It was still in the reach, and I was exploring the southwest of the map when I encountered my first curator. It was massive, it hit like a truck, and I panicked, and even though I tried to get away, it would simply not stop pursuing me, and I eventually died. It's really easy to be ambushed by very dangerous creatures or enemy locomotives in this game, and air battles can get very tense, even if you're kitted out with great equipment on a high tier vessel. There are some very rough enemies out there, like guests, the Eaters of the Dead from the Blue Kingdom, or even the Dreadnoughts found throughout the Reach. 
Very soon after starting the game in the Reach region, you'll be made aware of the ongoing hostilities between the stovepipes and the Takates. Well here's some advice, side with the stovepipes, at least on a first playthrough. The dreadnoughts in this game can dish out a serious hurting to your hull, as the Takates are some of the easiest enemies in the game. But the point that I'm trying to get at with all this rambling about the challenging and engaging combat is that the prime reason why it's so damn tense is because like the first game, Sunless Skies is intended to be played with permadeath turned on, and it can be brutal. For both games in the Sunless series, the whole permadeath thing was something I really had a hard time jiving with, at least at first. And that's because a significant amount of your time in these games is devoted to reading. When I play a roguelike, or even something like Darkest Dungeon or Slay the Spire, I'm all on board with permadeath, because those games tend to be all about fast, thrilling gameplay, or turn-based combat, where each run might feel radically different to the next. But, for these games, although there's a lot of exploring, fighting and trading, there's also a massive volume of reading, because the text-based sections which tend to occur when it ports, are when things actually develop meaningfully in the world, and with quests. The trouble with this is, do you really want to continually read and then reread the same passages of text every time you die? And by the way, you will die in this game. Don't get me wrong, once you get a good understanding of the mechanics, combat and enemy types, your chances of survival increase significantly. But even so, at some point you will get sloppy and croak it, or come close. The first time I died, I was frustrated as hell, because that was about 6 hours of questing all for nothing, seemingly. Regardless of how far along you are in your main ambition, or any particular questline at any of the four regions, that all gets reset. However, it's not that bad, because not all is lost. When you die, your next captain will inherit some of your cargo, some equipment, and some money. Furthermore, almost all the progress you've made exploring the maps is actually kept, and even better, any experience you gain from discovering ports or landmarks is also kept, and so you won't lose all your levels. Thus, as devastating as it can be to die in this game, there are a bunch of factors which certainly do take the sting out of it, whereas things were a fair bit more punishing in Sunless Sea, let me tell you. But for those not at all interested in the possibility of losing a ton of progress, you can actually turn permadeath off entirely. And in fact, there's actually no reward in this game to leaving it on, <laughs> other than your own satisfaction. Although I started off not so sure about permadeath here, I now prefer it and always have it turned on. It makes things way more tense and meaningful, both in combat and if you happen to be running low on fuel and supplies, or high on terror. That said, I wouldn't blame anyone for turning it off, and if you're a total beginner to the series, it might be better to just leave it off at first, if it means you're going to be more likely to stick with the game. Because just like with Sunless Sea, this game is well worth sticking to, I promise you that. And now, we must talk more about what you'll be doing with the remainder of your time with this game, reading. See, Sunless Sea had the best writing I have ever experienced in a game. The world of fallen London is absolutely captivating. The concepts, characters, locations, horrors and wonders. Everything was so incredibly well written and there was so much of it. Even on newer playthroughs of that game, there's always some little tidbit of text that I've never seen before and I love it. And so you can imagine my expectations being rather on the high side when coming into this game. Well, I'll say this. Some of the Skies has the second best writing I've ever experienced in a game. I do not say that to diminish this game in any way, because it was always going to be impossible for anything to top the first game in my eyes. Because in case you haven't gotten the picture yet, I love Sunless Sea. What you should take from what I just said is that the writing in this game is nearly as good as it gets. The imagination of the writing team is on full display here, with each port of each region being delightfully intriguing. You've got places like Titania, situated on a massive flower and thus constantly plagued by attacks from swarms of giant bees. Then you have the Clockwork Sun in Albion, continuously spinning and shifting, betraying hints of bitter sentience. Then in Eleutheria, you have Eagles in Pyrian, which is a city fighting back against the pure and utter blackness 
of the region with the power of electricity. And then in the Blue Kingdom, you've got Death's Door, where all souls must eventually pass to face the astral judgement of the Sapphire King. That's just a tiny sample of the kinds of locations you'll be visiting by the way. There are a ton of weird, beautiful and dark ports, each with their own history, lore and culture. You'll meet countless characters on your travels through the sky too, always following the naming convention of adjective then noun, such as the repentant devil, the fastidious inspector, or the inconvenient ant. You'll be able to recruit some such characters to your crew to serve as officers, giving you stat bonuses, and also having their own extensive and detailed quest lines to engage in, often requiring specific items to progress and having you zip to different ports all throughout the heavens. The writing in this game deals with all sorts of themes too, from questions around membership to an exclusive hunting club, then other times contemplating the dreadful ramifications of a dead, lacking son. Tone can shift widely too depending on where you are, and there will be light-hearted situations meant to make you smile, while at other times things will get far more serious indeed. As I mentioned near the start of the video though, this game is big on humour, and even in a lot of sections dealing with death and horror, you'll usually find some traces of wry humour thrown in. This does however mean that things are generally not as dark here as in the first game, and that goes for the writing, the environment and the atmosphere. As I said, things can certainly get very morbid in this game, but it just feels different. Maybe a bit less abyssal to the first game, if that makes sense, which it probably doesn't to anyone except me. To be fair, the starting region in Sunless Sea is the Reach, and this place could not be any further from the dark waters of the Untersea, whereas the other regions are certainly more shadowy and grim, especially Eleutheria. I'd say that there's also more overall text in Sunless Skies compared to the predecessor, because bear in mind this is a really big game with a ton of ports, characters and quest lines. As a result of this though, I have been known to get a bit burnt out at times with the reading. In fact, on my very first playthrough, I actually gave the game up for a few months after getting to Eleutheria, because truth be told, I was just a bit fatigued by the game at that point and as cool and interesting as that new region was, sometimes you just can't be arsed. There certainly are a couple of locations in this game where the reading can feel like a bit of a chore, but let me be clear, these are few and far between. Furthermore, let me stress that the writing does not diminish in either volume or quality as you get to the later, more challenging regions. In fact, the last region most folk are most likely to visit, the Blue Kingdom, is some of the highest quality content in the game. I love this area, and while it definitely keeps up the humour, it's a very melancholy place too, which does make sense, it being a literal kingdom of the dead and all. In saying that though, sometimes the quest lines can get somewhat fatiguing, and that is in large part due to the disconnected nature of the game's four regions. Sometimes the next stage in a quest will require you to go to a far-flung port at a totally different region, and this can get tiring when you're doing that a lot, which many of the game's later quests will have you doing. Also, for as much as I just praised the Blue Kingdom region, patience can definitely wear somewhat thin here because there's a whole system of status there. See, you can be invisible, ephemera, anti-deceased or yoked, and depending on which status you are, certain areas and quests will be locked off to you here. You can go through the motions of having your status changed, but that will usually involve you having to visit a totally different port, and I hope you have the necessary items to do this. And God forbid if the next quest line requires you to be a different status altogether. I like the concept of all the statuses in this area, but by God, it can involve an excessive amount of fanning around. Regarding the music and graphics of the game, as if it needed pointing out from me, yes, they are unbelievable. I find the artwork to be some of the best I have ever seen in any game. It is grand, colourful, and let's not disregard just how varied it is. Each region is really big, and there are four of them, yet you'll constantly be seeing stunning new spectacles and environments. My favourite place in the whole game is probably the White Well, but this is just one of countless examples. And for the sheer number of ports found in all the regions in Sunless Skies, each one somehow looks and feels completely unique. 
There are none which felt tacked on. No, they are all a joy to behold. And again, some look unbelievable. Some with C had some pretty basic graphics, but I still loved how that game looked, and a lot of the artwork there was also beyond striking. But, gotta say, Sunless Skies has it beat hands down in this department. The music is another source of utter joy for me. I love the soundtrack. There's a great variety of tracks appropriate for each region, and some of them are downright beautiful. My favourite track in the whole game is Dead TikTok Time. And when it comes on, when I'm out exploring the Blue Kingdom, oh, well, let's just say that that is my idea of peak gaming. Not only does Sunless Skies have a thick, delicious atmosphere, but it boasts a range of atmospheres for each biome at each of the four regions, and it is aspects like this that make me certain that I will be thinking of moments from this game for years to come. Sunless Skies is pretty much the perfect successor to Sunless Sea. It improves upon it in most ways, while also keeping a lot of what made the first game so special. After sinking a ton of hours into it, like its predecessor, I can say that I love this game. I confess that I still prefer the first game, but honestly nothing was ever going to change that. If you enjoyed Sunless Sea and want more, get this game, obviously. But then if Sunless Sea wasn't for you, which by the way, it wasn't for me either the first time I played it then I'd still recommend Sunless Skies, especially if you're intrigued by any of what you saw here. Even though the combat is more challenging, it's more accessible to beginners, not to mention prettier. I really hope that we see another game in the Sunless series in the future, because you really can't find this sort of high quality experience anywhere else. But, who knows. And with that, as always, I will say cheers for watching and cheerio.